I'm not going to speak directly on the verse today. I'm going to continue with the subject of the last two days because more things came in my mind about that. Uh, I'm not so smart or Krishna doesn't inspire me that everything all comes at once. Things come gradually and come gradually. Think about this. There's, there's such, oh, I'll also say there was a point I wanted to make yesterday about uh, devotees enjoying or not enjoying Krishna. So remind me, I'll say something about that also. Um, yeah, the topic of fanaticism and sentimentalism. You may wonder why, well, why go on and on speaking about this? Uh, it is an important subject because although Krishna consciousness is completely pure and transcendental and beyond the modes of nature, not everyone who takes to Krishna consciousness, actually everyone who takes to Krishna consciousness pretty much, they, they start as at the neophyte stage, which means that their understanding is mixed. Uh, it's, they're not free from material conceptions and contaminations. And so... Um, The likelihood is that just as uh, all religions of the world are conducted on the basis of sentimental or fanaticism, so our Krishna consciousness, at least to some extent, is likely to be. When we say that all religions are conducted on the basis of sentimentalism or fanaticism, that is on the basis of Srila Prabhupada's statement that Religion without philosophy is sentimentalism, or sometimes fanaticism. So, we don't find in any of whatever is called the different religions of the world, that they have any clear understanding of Krishna. They're incomplete, at best. Uh, so, due to, their lack, due to their lack of knowledge in these religious systems, they uh, must be, uh, the, or the, those who take to it must be fanatical or sentimental. Uh, and we can also be in Krishna consciousness. If, if we don't have knowledge of what Krishna consciousness is, Sambandha Abhideya Prayojan, what is our relationship with Krishna, the proper method of acting in that, rela or, or refurbishing that relationship, and actually enter entering, actually entering into that relationship, then we must be affected by sentimentalism and or fanaticism. Neither is a very good platform. Um, that uh, that's a neophyte platform. One's advancement in Krishna consciousness de is defined in terms of one's Faith, Shadhavanjan Hoi Bhakti Adhikari, Uttam Madhyam Kanishta Shadha Anushari. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that faith is the uh, qualification for taking to Bhakti. And one is classified as a uh, neophyte, intermediate, or topmost devotee according to one's development of faith. Now we may say, well, the fanatic is very faithful. There's a lot of faith, right? I mean, people can uh, go to their death thinking that it's better to die, or it's, it's good to die for my religion. I will be rewarded. They have, they have such faith. A, we, we talk about as dear as life, but dearer than life. Some people, they, they feel that I'll, I can it, it's worthwhile to kill myself or, or, or to, to risk my life or, uh, because I will get a, re a reward in the afterlife. They have so much faith. And that's there in every religious system. There are Christian martyrs and then the uh, Islamic jihadis and in Hinduism also the Women, formerly, there was the sati right, 
was going on. Um, or kshatriyas go to fight. They, 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 they go into a battle, know they're going to die, but they think it's because of dharma I cannot retreat in the battlefield. <clears throat> so like this, their faith is strong that there is, there is, uh, they will be rewarded after death. Uh, whether or not that's correct is, well, if they don't have a clear understanding, then it's, uh, <clears throat> then they're going to be wrong. Either they're right or they're wrong. Just like we're told that certain people commandeered airplanes to fly into the erstwhile twin towers of the World Trade Center, believing that by doing so they would be rewarded by Allah. So uh, what kind of heavenly delights they are enjoying now, we don't know, we doubt it. Uh, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> that kind of faith <coughs> is not the kind of faith that, uh, that uh, pure devotee has. The faith in Krishna consciousness means shadha shabde vishash kahe sudrida nishchay je krishna bhakti koile sharva kama krita hoy that by performing activities in Krishna consciousness everything else is accomplished, everything is taken care of. There's, in other words, there's no need to do anything else. This is, uh, it means faith in Krishna's words. Manmana bhavamad bhagto madhyaji mam namaskuru savadhaman parityaja mame kam sharnam braja ahang tvam sarva pape bhiyo moshe yashami mashvicha It means to have faith that by being Krishna conscious and surrendering to Krishna that Krishna will look after us. And that faith uh, is, is, if it is blind faith then that is uh, fanatic, that is fanaticism. But uh, the whole point is that uh, we should not take to Krishna consciousness or anything for that matter, simply blindly. It should be on the basis of knowledge. Um, faith is required, but it should be reasonable faith based on knowledge. So, uh, if we're sentimentalists, or fan if we take to Krishna consciousness in a sentimental way, or a fanatical way, then we are, if we get into that mold of being a sentimentalist or a fanatic, then we can't properly advance, we remain on the neophyte platform. So it is important to understand this. One has to come to the platform of jinyasu, of being inquisitive. One shouldn't think that, well, uh, now I took to Krishna consciousness and I'm following the four regulated principles, chanting Hare Krishna, that's it. I'm, I'm perfect. That's it. I don't have to, that's it. I don't have to do anything else. But we have to uh, understand why we are doing what we are doing. Otherwise, we may very well end up in the same situation as so many who were chanting Hare Krishna and following the four regulated principles, but are no longer doing so. And of course, by Krishna's grace, they may again come back to devotional service, but un unless and until one's devotional service becomes uh, strong on the platform of pure attachment, then uh, one is liable to fall away, or at least one cannot make adequate progress. And there's a problem with both the sentimentalist and the fanatic. They both think that the, the tendency may be there to think they're already there. The sentiment, I, I feeling for Krishna, just like we were talking about Mirabai yesterday. But then, where's the philosophy or the understanding to back that up? Or for the fanatic, simply by his insistence, thinks that he's already there. But they don't really know what they're doing, or, uh, so they don't properly advance. So, this is required, so that's the, why we should discuss these things. They're, neither position is very good. The, uh, 
the fanatic is fanatically insisting that my way is the best, our way is the best. But the sentimentalist, he also thinks like that. It's just like you'll find people who they say that they're very broad-minded and liberal and they say that, well, everyone should have the same equal opportunity and everyone should be treated. We, we accept all opinions. This is a liberal kind of sentimental outlook. But then uh, that's an impossible proposition to accept all outlooks. Or to, everyone should have the right to whatever opinion they like. Well, what if my opinion is that everyone should not have the right to believe whatever they like. So can you, if you accept that opinion, or if you give me the right to have that opinion, then uh, your proposition is already defeated. That's why we find that uh, people are very much, people who believe in democracy and fairness, and they're very much against fascism. But then Hitler was voted in, right? <laughs> We find also that uh, it doesn't happen so much now, but when communist governments get voted in, America, the protectors of democracy, they do their best to kick them out, even though they're democratically elected. And that's happened. That happened several times during what was called the Cold War. Heard about that in South America, in Grenada, the, the, the tiny little island off the coast of America. The... Uh, American Marines came in when uh, some, someone who wasn't, by the democratic process, someone who wasn't a proponent of democracy got voted in. So their sentiment that, that, everyone, that you, everyone should have the right to choose uh, <coughs> that it, it's self-defeating. And anyway, it's a silly system as you see in America people vote for the most silly reasons right? just like John F. Kennedy got voted in because he was more good looking than Tricky Dicky Nixon so you know, it's ridiculous the women voted for him more because he was more sexy I guess and, you know, that's what they thought that's, that was the analysis of how he won the election so, and people vote for all the and someone, uh, a peanut farmer, and then uh, a B, B movie actor, they get elected. Well, what's their qualification, actually? And what's the qualification of people to vote? They can't understand all the different issues. So many people, they can't even read or write. Yes, in America also. And they, they, but they have a right to vote. In India, people have a right to vote, but there's so many of them, they can't read or write. And what are they going to understand about all the issues? So, anyway, it's just uh, sh showing that uh, sentimentalists, they may, th they, they may say, yes, we're very fair, we're very nice to everyone, we should all be, but if someone's philosophy is that we shouldn't be nice to everyone, then they, they can become very not nice themselves. Just like in the, in the uh, Vedic culture, capital punishment is not only allowed, but it's... Uh, stipulated for certain crimes. But people who are sentimentally nice think that, no, this is very wrong. But actually it's very wrong not to have it. Because, and, and it's a violence, we may think was too violent a punishment, but not, uh, not, uh, administering capital punishment in cases when it should be is, is worse violence to the person concerned, to the criminal, because he suffers more from not being capitally punished than he does by uh, so, than by being executed. Because people don't know; they just have a sentiment. They don't have knowledge. They don't have knowledge of the laws of karma, so they think, "Well, it's not very nice." killing someone, which is true, but it's, uh, although it's not nice, it's, uh, 
it's better for the person and for everyone and for society at large that it be done. So the sentimental is nice, but he can get very unnice when it comes to people who don't agree with his basic axioms or what he considers to be axioms. And we see that the, uh, the war in Iraq is being justified in the name of humanitarianism and democracy. And, and I guess uh, many people in Iraq would consider that they'd rather have less humanitarianism and less democracy and less bombs blowing them to pieces all the time too. You know, we're so, we're so, uh, we're so concerned with democracy that uh, we're going to blow you all to pieces until you accept it. So it, it's became a sacred principle. Hitler invaded surrounding countries. What was the name of his doctrine? The ex land expansion. They teach you all that. You don't know. They don't teach you. It's kind of forgotten in the German psyche. Is it? Maybe it's touchy to talk about Hitler in Germany. But he had a doctrine that of, of expanding the land. We don't have enough space. for the Germans. I read it. I saw it in, I don't know, some website or something. Anyway, I don't know the word. I thought you might, but probably they don't even teach you about it. Just like in India, they don't teach about, in the schools, the history about all the... Uh, Muslim atrocities, it's kind of just like edited out of this, uh, of the curriculum. So uh, he, uh, he, he had a, uh, what seemed to some to be reasonable, uh, to, that, look, we need some more land, get out you useless people, we're, we're better than you. Um, and Certain other people have a philosophy that, look, you're not democratic, so we're going we're gonna to come in there and make things better for you. But it comes to the same thing. It's, they, they, both, they occupy someone else's land and they have their own self-interest at heart. So what goes on in the name of being nice and sentimentalism uh, can be very dangerous and bad, actually, for the whole of human society. So... Um, in general, uh, we would think that a sentimentalist is nicer than a fanatic. Uh, we might think like that generally, just like in the West. Uh, the Dalai Lama is probably thought of as being a better person than a uh, jihadi, Islamic leader. Who are they? Who, who, who are you don't... Uh, Oh, Bin Laden, of course. I'm just trying to think of some name. Of course, he's kind of forgotten nowadays because he was the excuse for invading Afghanistan. When they invaded, they kind of forgot about him. So you don't hear much talk about him these days. So, uh, yeah, most people would think, isn't it, that Dalai Lama is a better person than Bin Laden because Dalai Lama is nice and Bin Laden isn't. Or, or in the Islamic world, probably people think that Bin Laden is is better. They, they, you're more likely to see someone with a t-shirt in, in Cairo, you're more likely to see someone with a t-shirt of Bin Laden than the Dalai Lama. So, which is better? Actually, they both suffer from the same problem. One is a sentimentalist and one is a fanatic. And they're both ignorant of the goal of life and they're both causing the, the, the problems. They're both meat-eaters and they're propagating something in the name of religion which is based on ignorance and which leads to suffering by promoting meat-eating, for instance. So they're both the cause of, uh, or they're both part of the cause of the problems. Then neither of them have the solution. Uh, <clears throat> but in general, I, mean, I think, well, Dalai Lama is much nice because he smiles and he talks of peace and... Like that uh, transcendental meditation, Yogi Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, something like that. He died recently, uh, kind of, uh, after a quiet end to his life for many years. He was kind of out of the picture. So the classic photo of him was is like like a classic stereotypical bogus Yogi with smiling with a long beard and long hair and holding a flower. That was it. That's the 
Of course, he wasn't a meat eater, as far as I know. Um, so the idea, that it, seems, it seems very nice. So it's better to be nice and believe in goodness and goodwill and don't be nasty to others. Um, and it might seem that Krishna consciousness is like that. Because like I said, we have bells and we have flowers and incense and flowing robes and vegetarian food and it all seems very nice. But then when you open the Bhagavad Gita, Namang Dushkujano Mudha all rascals and fools. Uh, so what's the balance? What is the... Where should we be? Should we be like more nice or should we be more heavy? Or we should follow the Acharyas, those who are seers of the truth. And do everything based on Bhagavad Gita. That is our authority. That is... Our authority means uh, we accept... Sarva meta dritang banye yang mang vadasi keshava. We accept as factual everything that Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. And again, what Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, it's not just simply some dogma, but actually uh, it is the uh, Raja Vidya Raja Guhyam, the topmost knowledge, the topmost mystery, and Everyone will say that, but then if we, everyone in every religious system will say that, but if we examine how this uh, knowledge of Bhagavad Gita is the uh, pinnacle of the whole Vedanta system, in which all uh, various what we might call religious or even secular philosophies are, are considered. In Sankhya, it's not really religious at all. It's, it's, it's more like modern science. So all, all different philosophies are considered and the uh, conclusion of Krishna consciousness is established in Bhagavad Gita. So actually, all the philosophies of the world, past, present and future, are considered, uh, at least in their generic forms, in Vedanta. You're referring to Vedanta Sutra. Voidism, Buddhism, Jainism, Western voidist existentialism, it's all considered and the, the inadequacies of those systems are shown and the, the actual reality of Krishna consciousness is established. But if we don't understand this, then we're also fanatics and sentimentalists. So, uh, yeah, we're talking about the balance. The balance is that we follow Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. And... In, we have in Bhagavad Gita flowers, patram, pushpam, palam, toya. We have singing, satatam, kirti, antoma. And we also have namang, duskuti, no murha, the rebuking of the sinful persons. So, Krishna consciousness, is it sentimental or fanatical? Neither. And where should we be sentimental or fanatical? Neither. Sentimental, yes. In this, on the platform of pure sentiment, that is required. Bhava. But that bhava, Lord Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, arises from knowledge of Krishna's position. Who knows that verse apart from Adi Purush? Prabhu. Anyone? Well known verse in Bhagavad Gita. Bhava, or feeling from Krishna, arises from knowledge of his supremacy. Hmm? What is it? Please say it. Buddha Bhava Samandita. Yes. Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo Mata Sarvam Prabhatate Iti Matva Pajante Mam Buddha Bhava Samandita. 
when one, uh, those who know Krishna's supremacy, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the source of everything, then uh, one engages in Krishna's service with feeling. So sentimentalism is required and conviction, not fanaticism. But both should be on the basis of knowledge. So a sentimentalist seems nice and a fanatic doesn't seem nice. Neither of them are really very nice because sentimentalism can turn to fanaticism also. We'll see, just like for instance... Um, Well, a sentimentalist uh, believes in being good and nice to others and will find many, there are many nice people in the world, even Srila Prabhupada, while sometimes saying that 99% that of the population are demons and anyone who's not Krishna. Those who don't surrender to Krishna, they're fools and rascals. So that means almost everyone in the world. But on the other hand, Srila Prabhupada also said that most of the people are, actually they're not bad, but they're misled by others, by the leaders. And he would make statements like, your country is very nice, speaking about America. And that's my personal experience in America, in particular. Maybe because I can speak to the people, and I can't speak to them very easily in Germany, but I find American people in general are very, uh, they're very nice, maybe too nice, because, you know, if you're sitting on a plane or something, you just want to chant japa, and they're almost, the person sitting next to you will strike up a conversation. They're very friendly, I mean, maybe too friendly, like I say. And you'll see, uh, just like traveling on planes, and people, they'll strike up conversations, talk with each other, make friends, and like, uh, so, maybe the era of the ugly American, or the stereotype of the ugly American is over, and Americans are, very nice. Of course, the same nice people, uh, maybe out of ignorance, they're eating meat, or they're not accepting Krishna. But there's a general, among many people, there's a general sentiment to be good. And even the, of course, the religions of the world, they teach that, even if not in a very uh, comprehensive or, uh, or manner or a manner based on knowledge of tattva, of, of who is Krishna and what is our relationship with him. They teach, uh, give charity, that's an essential principle of Islam, give charity to the poor and hospitality in Vedic culture. Looks like you lost the, lost it there. Is it? Or it's just trying to struggle back? It's okay. So, Atiti Bho Deva, the, the, uh, the guest, the unexpected guest is considered to be God. So, hospitality and... We'll often find that uh, just like there's an image promoted in the world of the of Islam being very extreme and so there may be an idea of most Muslims they're very extreme people ready to kill anyone at the drop of a hat but then if we, if we actually meet the average person and they're, they're often very friendly people very hospitable and if you travel in various Muslim countries, you may find that people, they invite you into their home and want to feed you, and it's difficult for devotees. But, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that spirit of uh, welcoming others and the simple faith in God, there's many, many, even today, they, they follow very strictly five times a day. I mean, I don't know if it's the majority of Muslims in the world, but definitely a large percentage of them, they faithfully offer their prayers five times a day and follow the uh, fasting during the months of Ramadan, uh, which can be very difficult if it, in Arabia, if it falls 
And in India, if it falls in June, for or May or June, when it's extremely hot, so but still they follow. Uh, so we find that uh, many people are their 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 basic behavior is nice and. Uh, they're actually very religious and pious. But that senti- that be- because they don't have knowledge, that can be considered sentimentalism. They can't really, they don't really understand why they're doing it, but they do it. They have a sentiment to be good and be nice and not to be an atheist. And they're nice to others, but they don't have very deep understanding, which means that they can be very easily misled. And the sentimentalist can very quickly turn to a fanatic. Just like um, there's a story in that book, Freedom at Midnight, which uh, describes or gives some perspective on the uh, the independence of India in 1947 and the simultaneous independence and breaking up into two states, India and Pakistan. So it's described there that during the uh, during that time, during the independence period, there was a lot of fighting between Hindus and Muslims, in, especially in Punjab and Bengal, which were the uh, played the these two states that were divided between Pakistan and India, um, and there was there was just one incident. A few incidents were described too, which kind of capture the absurdity of a lot of it. That one, one man in Lahore, which was, uh, I believe this city was predominated by Hindus, but the, the surrounding countryside was predominated by Muslims. So in a Hindu tea shop, a Muslim man used to come every morning for tea on his way to work. And he'd been doing that for the last 30 years. But now the communal passion was being whipped up. Hindus against, well, it was more, on that side it was more Muslims against Hindus. And uh, so one morning the man, the Muslim man walked into the tea shop and the tea shop owner, seeing him coming, started to pour his tea out because he'd been doing it every day for the last 30 years. But on this fine day, uh, the Muslim man who had been coming to his shop for 30 years, pulled out a gun and shot the tea shop owner dead. And there are many such instances in the uh, in the recent war between Serbians and Croatians. People have been living in the same village all their lives, been friend all their lives. All of a sudden, they just started killing each other mercilessly, just because one was a Serb and the other was Croatian. And Serbs are Orthodox Christians, and Croatians are Catholics. So that was also supposed to be a factor. So. Uh, the, the, their sentimental friendship by propaganda has very quickly turned to fanatical hatred. Because they, and, and, and people are wondering, I, I remember seeing a report, or how, how could this happen in Europe in the 20, at the end of the 20th century? <laughs> Where people are supposed, now people are educated, and after World War II, they were supposed to be enlightened, and uh, that we now we've seen for all time we have seen the results of fascism and hatred and we'll educate people to equal rights and all all persons have equal rights and everyone should respect others and all this kind of education is going on and, and still f- meaninglessly that's it, it, it one of the symptoms of Kali Yuga Brita Hingsa, that's stated in Bhagavatam, meaningless violence is a symptom of Kali Yuga. So, yeah, the sentimentalist, he doesn't have knowledge, so he's friends with others, but because he doesn't have knowledge, he can be easily turned to hate others. Srila Prabhupada is a very interesting article in one of the Back to Godhead magazines, uh, which Srila Prabhupada wrote before coming to the West. And he was quoting a, a leader, I think it was a Christian leader in England, talking about the World War, the Second World War, talking about the frenzy of hatred, which was the Second World War. It was a, 
people were hating each other and killing each other. It was a frenzy. Frenzy, do you know what that, you know what that means? It means like a, 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 a mad activity. Very, very vigorous and insane activity. So the frenzy of hatred is the Second World War. But Srila Prabhupada uh, observed in this article that we cannot get rid of the frenzy of hatred until we get rid of the frenzy of love. Because they're both two sides of the same coin. In the material world, what goes on in the name of love means I favor my group. Which means that although we may say yes, we respect all others, but practically uh, we like our group better than others. And nowadays, uh, or at least for the last more than 50 years, they haven't had any world wars, but they have soccer matches in which, for instance, Germany is pitted against yeah, any other country. What's the next country? France or whatever. And maybe it's a lot better that they, they scream and they yell and they boo and they clap and rather than having a war, but it's the same propensity is being cultivated. These are, we are Germans and they are French and we don't like them. And you find people hating other football teams, they cultivate that. So that can, uh, and sometimes it does boil over also into actual violence and even killing. Soccer violence, they call it. It's not really soccer violence, it's just madness. That's all. It's got really nothing to do with the game of football, and it's just madness. So the, the, the madness of love, the flip side is always going to be a frenzy of hate. That's why without knowledge, the sentimentalist, he doesn't actually have knowledge, he has a general feeling that we should be nice and good, which is, we can say a general, it's better than the general feeling of throwing people in, uh, wanting to see people line in, lined up and thrown into hell forever. But on the other hand, it's, uh, it can very easily turn to that also. The, the, the frenzy of love, it can very easily turn into the frenzy of hate. Here in, sorry if I'm offending you by all these examples, but uh, here in Germany also, uh, how did the Nazi regime go on? It was ordinary people, the baker, the banker, the teacher, ordinary people became uh, members of the SS and uh, organized capturing Jews and sending them off to concentration camps. And they were just people who were, the same in Serbia and Croatia just a few years ago, was ordinary people who every day you'd say, how are you? Guten Morgen and all this kind of thing. And the same person, the same nice person is uh, you know, just a short time later, he's uh, head of a squadron for rounding up Jews and sending them off to be tortured and killed. How did that happen? Because they have no knowledge of the goal of life and they're, they're easily misled due to not having proper knowledge or discrimination. So beware of this niceness, of the material niceness. And um, also we should not mistake what appears to be niceness to be in and of itself saintliness. A saintly person is nice, but his niceness uh, may well be manifested as his vociferating or, or speaking very strongly against uh, rascaldom, as Srila Prabhupada used the word rascal, fool, nonsense, animal, etc., referring to people who didn't, in ordinary, or in, in the vision of most people, didn't appear to be rascals or fools or animals or nonsense, but Srila Prabhupada referred to them as such. That was his saintliness. And someone else who, and if someone says, no, no, actually they're all very good and there's nothing wrong, that is not saintly, because they're going against the version of Krishna. So, uh, Sentimentalism and fanaticism, they're both two sides of the same coin. It's, it's uh, love based on lack, lack of knowledge and hate based on lack of knowledge. And they, they can be mixed also. Like one can be fanatically sentimental, just like I gave the, 
that example of someone may they may be uh, yes we should be fair to all but if you're not fair to all we're going to harass you like and get on your case and and call you all bad names and uh, maybe even attack your country and kill you so fanatically sentimental or you can find the the fanatics who are like sentimental and they 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 all come together and say yes it's by god's grace that we conquered over the enemy and they have no idea of who god is or what his grace is but they they have some sentimental belief that god is behind them so they're really uh two sides of the same coin and uh, you can see that uh, although the fanatic openly says that he's the best and the sentimentalist says that no all opinions are good everything's the same they also think they're the best because if you don't agree with their weltanschauung is that how you say it is german word weltanschauung weltanschauung the their world view it's in english among better educated uh people like myself it's it's a considered a trendy word for world view that's what it means right a way of seeing the world um so uh yeah if you don't if you don't agree with what they say then they become uh, fanatically against you so they also think they're the best even though they say yeah all opinions are equal and everyone but if you don't agree with this opinion then you're wrong so they also think they're the best so they they both lacking knowledge that krishna is the best and what it means to surrender to him so we should uh, neither be sentimentalists or fanatics we may say well yeah i i did my bhakti shastri course i'm not a sentimentalist but it may be that if our underlying outlook is sentimental then we can have bhakti shastri degree i'm not speaking against that per se but i'm just saying that um we have to learn to it, it's not just a matter of getting a degree and declaring ourselves or or being declared a bhakti shastri as we should say bhakti shastra degree is not could be either i guess It's like saying Mayavad philosophy, Mayavadi philosophy, more or less the same. Anyway, um, we may have that, but the real uh, Bhakti Shastra he sees through the eye of Shastra. He apply, applies that in life. He learns to discriminate on the basis of Shastra, which requires us to surrender. It's not just a matter of. getting a degree as a as a kind of adjunct to our sentimental or fanatical approach but to actually live with shastric vision then we'll neither be a sentimentalist or a fanatic otherwise if we just learn it with the idea then well really krishna conscious is only feeling but then i also got my bhakti shastri degree but feeling yes but the understanding is uh, inseparable proper understanding without that then our feeling just like uh, we we say i feel for krishna but how how can you feel how can you love him if you don't know who he is or what he likes and knowing who he is means understanding krishna with all his energies so uh the conclusion is that we should not we should have knowledge and for that purpose the the uh bhakti shastra courses have been started but uh it is required that we we really enter into the spirit of that and not just not think that it's simply academic it's that knowledge it's supposed to be guru mukha padma vakya chite te kuriya aikya be one with our heart it's not one with our mind it's not simply an intellectual exercise but really we have to uh enter into the understanding make it one with our consciousness so we see shri prabhu is uh, always speaking philosophy 
constantly and, and very strongly establishing Krishna consciousness. You see, we have lectures, conversations, letters. And of course, some of his letters and some of his conversations, which those conversations weren't recorded much, which they may be about managerial matters, this and that, but he, he, sp he spoke regularly the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. So that is required. That's, that's what a, a guru does, teaches his disciples. Of course, we, you see there are like, just like some sahajiyas, prakrita sahajiyas, they just tell stories and leelas and then everyone cries, but then what do these, what do people know about Krishna, actually? They should, that, that's, uh, or even, even in our ISKCON, if we only tell stories and this and that, and we don't inculcate the philosophy, or if we think that, well, philosophy is just for the Bhakti Shastra course. You, you study and then you do, and then, but at other times it's all, you know, Leela and Bhav, but that, that's what I'm saying, we have to make the knowledge, we have to internalize it. Atmasat. Hridayangam. That word is there, make it one with our heart. So, uh, unless we do that, then even if we have a Bhakti Shastra degree and then and we're following everything, but that can change very quickly. And we see that just like uh, in Iskon, time to time, there's a, a guru falls away and most of his disciples fall away with him because why is that? Because they don't have a proper understanding of Krishna. If they actually understood that my relationship with Krishna is eternal, then they would never go away. But because they were just thinking, they had a sentimental attachment to their guru and that, that be, that they lost their faith because it was reposed only in their guru but not in sadhu, not in other other sadhus are not in Shastra. Therefore they went away. So it's a dangerous position to be sentimental. One should uh, understand what is Krishna consciousness and therefore the, the Acharya should teach this to their disciples. Srila Prabhupada is always speaking philosophy. So that should go on. Uh, then, yeah, any question about this? Then I have another point about the uh, devotees enjoying Krishna or not enjoying Krishna. Yes, please. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, generally, uh, we, we have heard in lectures... Oh, oh, one other point I'd just like to make. Sorry, yeah. just, before, um, just, just popped into my mind. There's always more to say. Yeah. Um, we can expect that in the beginning people will come sentimentally, maybe fanatically. Because in the, begin in the beginning people won't have knowledge and sen sentimentalism may be a way to attract people also, make them feel good, you can say. Which isn't a bad thing if they're feeling good about Krishna. And we often hear that people when they first come they have so much bliss, but that's not the perfect level of Krishna consciousness. That, that's also, it's not exactly totally mundane sentimentalism because it is in relationship to Krishna but at the same time um, that cannot be considered the fully realized state and we have to bring people in and train them yeah uh, generally the Another thing, there's nothing wrong with sentimental. Sentiment is required. It's, Krishna is not just an, uh, a, a subject of philosophical study. He's to be loved. But again, that love should be on the basis of knowledge. Just like in, uh, in traditional Indian families, they arrange marriages and it's expected that the, the husband and wife to be will love each other, but still the marriage is arranged with various factors on considering uh, 
Well, there are so many factors. The age, the caste, the economic status, the educational status, the uh, health status, etc. of the bride and or the boy and girl as they're called or before they before they're married. So it's not it's it's not arranged marriage that just uh, the parents get together and say uh, one hey uh, do you want to give your girl to my uh, son? Is not no. There's so many considerations. It's done on the basis of knowledge, and then it's expected that the Love, which is actually not talked about much in traditional societies, but it, the, or the affection will develop. And practically, uh, anyway, that's another discussion, which comes up in that book, Glimpses of Traditional Indian Life. But the point is that love has to, it's not that love is denied, but ra rather it is wanted. That is, Krishna consciousness means love. But, uh, so that is not denied, but at the same time you have to be very careful not to um, s simply approach in a sentimental way in which our love, it's actually not very solid. It may seem very strong. I mean, we find a boy falls in love with a girl and their feeling may seem very strong, but it's not on a solid platform at all. It's not the real thing. So in Krishna consciousness, our love has to develop by knowledge of Sambandha, relationship with Krishna, has to develop on the basis of following the rules and regulations of Shastra under the guidance of devotees, and then gradually our feelings will, de genuine feelings for Krishna will develop. But it can, it, it can be that someone, they, they, their feelings are sentimental and they just cultivate that throughout their whole lives and they never really understand what they're doing and therefore we find that uh, even devotees who have been many years in the movement they they uh, they don't understand basic points that for instance mundane welfare work is of no actual value to anyone they never understood because they're still on the sentimental platform yes what were you going to say uh, this, uh, sentimentalism and fanaticism uh, generally is again uh, dependent on our own uh, endeavor and interpretation. And the our own endeavor and interpretation? Our own endeavor? Endeavor means that if I am not sincerely putting effort to to apply Bhagavad Gita, uh, I might still feel that yeah, I am progressing and uh, I, I am... Doing we might feel that we are progressing but we, uh, we don't really know what progress is. Self-corrective measure, um, self-corrective not so much, but it's more that one is to be corrected under the guidance of guru and sadhus. It's not a do-it-yourself process. Like I was saying about your friend, he, he decided to read Chaitanya Charitamrita. I said, why did he decide? You're supposed to take to Krishna consciousness under the guidance of guru. And guru will tell you what to read and what not to read. It's not that, well, I thought about it, then I decided. But that's... That's not the way Krishna Conscious works. It's not a do-it-yourself process. Teach yourself Krishna Conscious in 30 days. Become a Mahabhagavat in 30 days. Our own personal endeavor is required, but that personal endeavor has to be under the guidance of those who direct us properly. Yeah. One part was Maharaj already answered. The other part is then uh, generally in Western places, not every place is best where we have senior association and guidance on regular day to day. Yes, places. in many places there's not senior guidance or association. Yeah. It is a problem. So you become that senior guidance. It's required that devotees become learned, responsible compassionate in the sense that they want to um, transmit, communicate to others what they have received. We, we, we require that. Or it may be in some cases that devotees are advanced, but uh, we are, because of our neophyte state, we don't recognize that. We think 
someone who's a sannyasi, they must be advanced. Or someone who's a town president, and we don't recognize others who are advanced, but because they don't have the uh, stamp, they don't. They didn't get any position. They're not recognized as such. So the guidance may be there. That's why, uh, or the opportunity for guidance may be there. That's why. But one of the reasons why Bhakti Siddhanta Sahasrara Thakur introduced giving Brahmana status and sannyas status to persons who traditionally wouldn't have been considered eligible for that. Brahmana, it's not supposed to be you live in the, you know, you, you come and you chant Hare Krishna for some time and then after some time you get initiated and after some time they put a string on you. It's not supposed to be like that. One is... Brahmana is supposed to be a spiritually advanced person who is the guru of others. So it's required that, yes, we require vigorous and rigorous education so that devotees can be fit to lead others. Just like I was saying yesterday about the uh, this uh, Bhaktivinoda's or songs said to be by Bhaktivinoda, and even some of our acharyas may, iskon gurus may be singing them. They don't know, but then, of course, it's an emergency situation in the world today. Prabhupada, um, what did his disciples to initiate and guide others, and their commitment to Prabhupada and Krishna is their qualification to do so. But uh, traditionally, gurus came from the guruku. And Prabhupada wanted that, that, that children would be trained from a young age so that by the time they're young, they'd be fit to guide, at least uh, equipped with the knowledge by which they're uh, capable of teaching others. Maturity might take, come with time. But then if you're living in, if you're trained in a gurukul, then you can be, even a young man can be a wise, young wise man. So that is required. Yeah, Adi Purush Prabhu, you going to say something? You already answered my question. Uh, uh-huh. My question was, Pranachandra um, uh, Maharaj writes in uh, his book that uh, sometimes... Which one? He, he published two. The uh, unspoken, obstacles. unspoken Obstacles on the Path of Devotional Service, something like that, yeah. Mentions there uh, that sometimes uh, the older devotees uh, notice, notice, uh, develop a sort of a uh, habit of being uh, very aloof and emotionless. Older devotees develop a habit of being. He he comments. Purnachandra Maharaj comments that older devotees develop a, a habit of being aloof and emotionless. Emotion. Stone <laughs> his, his observation. Hmm. So he is uh, wondering are they actually doing the right thing? Because uh, uh, <coughs> there's a difference between sentiment and, as you mentioned, we need one sentiment, but like in Krishna consciousness. Yeah. So you already answered by mentioning that uh, Krishna consciousness is love. Mm-hmm. Mentioned this in the, even though the marriages, for example, were calculated and very meticulously um, selected, still there was love. It says that it shouldn't be. But the, but love, yeah. The example of the arranged marriage is that love will arise if uh, if it's on the the basis of uh, a relationship which is calculated on the basis of knowledge to work, and actually it did thousands of years until the recent time the system broke down. So in other words, uh, intelligence it's still going on to, to some extent, the arranged marriage system, but not in the not yeah, anyway. So if intelligence needs to be added to the <coughs> still there is a certain uh, there's a question still I think, mm. not quite can be a little confusing. Uh, Krishna, in the second chapter and other chapters, extols being uh, beyond duality. 
Krishna extols being being beyond duality, yeah. Like uh, not praising, not... Throughout the Bhagavad Gita, yeah. practically, yeah. So, sometimes we try to emulate that, mm. and uh, in the process, we, we try to stamp out any uh, feelings. So, what does this mean, stamping out feelings? Um, well, this means, this has to be understood in a Krishna conscious context, not, not in the impersonalist's context. For the impersonalist, that's, that's like an absolute. Uh, that suke duke same kritvar, or, or, or t- what is that? Matra spashas to konte yashita ushna suka duka, happiness and distress, one should be aloof from them. But then we should uh, understand that generally when the terms sukha and dukkha are used, they don't, we say happy, we just, it's translated as happiness and distress, but this is my understanding, that it actually refers more to the, it doesn't so much refer to the, uh, often when it's used, it doesn't so much refer to the mental state of happiness and distress as the possibilities for uh, material enjoyment or material distress, just like sukha is, that's considered in terms of one's wealth and uh, beautiful wife and all this kind of thing. I mean, Duke is considered poverty like this. So one should be the same in happiness and distress. If one, if one considers happiness and distress here to mean mental states, then by very definition one cannot be the same. You're already, by, by your mental attitude, you're already not, they're already diverse positions, so you can't be the same, but it means more in the opportunities for material happiness or distress. So a devotee should be ta- detached from material happiness and distress, but attached to serving Krishna. And although he, a devotee may seem to be very attached, and he is, but not for his own sense gratification. So, that is yukta vairagya. Vairagya, without knowledge of Krishna, becomes dry. Valgu vairagya. Shushka vairagya. But uh, renunciation be, should be in terms of service to Krishna. A devotee can use all the best facilities of the world and not be attached to them at all. That can be dangerous also. <laughs> if we have some attachment. But that's possible on the basis of knowledge again. Of knowledge of Prapanja, what is that? Nibanda, Nibanda, Krishna, Sambandhi, Yuktam, Bhairagya, Machete. Knowing everything, uh, knowing the relation of everything in relation to Krishna, one can be detached. That's actual detachment. Yeah, anything else? Any one of these subjects, you know, you just turn the door and go into the Yukta Vairagya discussion, that's another, you know. <laughs> hours and hours of discussion, so just trying to get the basics. That was one of Prabhupada's very great gifts, that, the, that just like this, 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 these points I've been talking over in th- three sessions, so often Prabhupada, just in one line, he'd sum up the whole thing. <laughs> But there's no harm to fluff it out and examine it in more detail also. So, I have understood correctly that uh, if we do observe anything like this happening, that the devotee becomes too remote and... The devotee becomes too remote. Out his, uh, they seem to be unconcerned. Unnaturally or artificially stifled. So it's like as stifling their own emotions. So does it mean that they have taken this principle of uh, not reacting to duality as an absolute without relationship to Krishna? Do we understand that if we see someone like that, that they have they have taken this principle of uh, not, reacting, not, reacting to the duality. not reacting to the dualities without seeing Krishna? In other words, they've become falgu vairagis. Well, I don't know what you're describing as a generalization. Often what happens is that a a devotee may seem to become more aloof just because of circumstances. Just like Prabhupada himself, for instance, in the very early days of ISKCON, he was very much available to everyone who came to him. But then 
by the time I joined in 1975, there was no question of walking up to Prabhupada and talking to him and you, 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 you told him, don't go on the morning walk. So Prabhupada appeared to be very aloof, but that was just, uh, it was just a necessity under the circumstances because it, w it would not be possible for him to have a personal 10-minute conversation with every one of his disciples everywhere he went. Although in, in the early days in New York, he would have sometimes hours-long conversations, with, uh, even with people who weren't committed. So, it may be circumstantial also. We didn't, we did, if a devotee seems they're becoming aloof, it, it, like I say, it may be just due to the, it, 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 to the circumstances like that. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's become an impersonalist, because he can't. He doesn't have a personal conversation with everyone that, that wants to have a conversation with him. It just may not be possible. What he meant there, within a conversation, when you already had a conversation with such a person, uh, that person is... The person may seem aloof. Poker-faced. Poker Poker-faced. I don't know. It... it, it well, from my experience as a, you know, up-and-coming guru, didn't make it to the big league yet, <laughs> coming up very slowly, is that, uh, yeah, it's your responsibilities increased. And again, you, you just can't interact with every... You may be in a rush to go off somewhere, or you may have programs here and there. Um, I, I mean, I know there are devotees who deliberately, who are in that situation, of having many disciples and many responsibilities, but at the same time, they do try to make an effort not to be wholly victimized by that, by that syndrome. And, uh, I mean, there are many instances. I mean, it's, it's just like, uh, no, I often, well, not often, but time to time, I meet Gopal Krishna Maharaj in Bombay, and, you know, he's always, there's so many things to do, so many places to go, and, but uh, you know, pretty much always he'll spend time with me and like that. Or in Pune once there was, we were at this youth festival and I just went out to the back of the stage. I, th I think I was going to pass water or something. And there was no one. But I just saw Radhanath Maharaj was sitting there on a the chair and there was someone else sitting on a chair with him. And you know, here he's got thousands of disciples and he's just sitting and chatting with one person who was uh, in kami clothes, probably wasn't a disciple. So like Jai Bhattaka Maharaj tries to, he's many disciples, but he tries to be very personal with everyone, tries to remember everyone's name, which he does so quite successfully. I, I, he seems, sometimes he remembers my disciples' names and I'm just trying to think, who, who's he talking about? So, so I mean, I just mentioned the name of three of the gurus in our movement. Have they each have several thousand disciples? But they are they are attempting to ex yeah to be very personal and extend themselves to others. Although uh, I think any of them, if you send them an email, you won't get. It's unlikely you're going to get a reply. But if you're there with them, they, they'll try to see you and talk with you and be personal. With you. What can you do? Prabhu Vishnu Maharaj told me that uh, three times it happened to him that uh, before he was, he was a, I guess you could say a new devotee at that time, three, three times it happened with him that in his presence, Prabhupada turning to leaders of the British devotees, later on of course Prabhu Vishnu Maharaj himself very quickly became a leader, that Prabhupada in Prabhupada's in Prabhupada Swami's presence, turned to other leaders and said, who is this? What is his name? He was already initiated. So Prabhupada didn't remember his name or who he was. Later, of course, he, but in the beginning, after he was initiated, he didn't know who he was. So. It's not surprising. Some aloofness might be there. Hare Krishna. All right, one more question, and we finish. I, uh, I have to rush off.
I want to rush off because, well, it's interesting, but I have lots of work to do also. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was, it was not always clear how to be, how to tolerate and uh, Sukha and Dukha, okay. How to tolerate happiness and distress. Yes, I can theoretically understand that one should be not uh, affected, affected by, by distress. But one should not be affected by distress. Yes, what's wrong to be affected? What's wrong to be affected by happiness? Yes. Well, that means just like uh, if one gets a lot of money and one thinks, oh, now I can enjoy it. One becomes, oh, great, wonderful, now I can enjoy it. But a devotee doesn't. He gets money and, uh, all right, we'll use it in Krishna's service. Does it mean only for material? Uh, no, no, no. If it's spiritual, if, if the money comes, then you use it and you're happy to have it to use in Krishna's service. Well, but are we supposed to, you know, like Prabhu said, to have some emotions or to have some joy when, you know, when uh, some festival is there or... When a festival is there, joy, yeah, joy in Krishna consciousness. When you, when you was able to distribute many books today? Distribute also. many books? Well, if one thinks that, yes, I've done so well, I'm so great, then you're in Maya. And then Krishna takes away the potency to do so. But if one, if one thinks that uh, Krishna is so kind, he's allowed me to be an instrument to do this, and doesn't feel elated on his own behalf, see, I'm so, I've done so well, Naturally, that feeling will be there. If one goes out all day and can hardly distribute one or two books, at the end of the day, you generally feel quite miserable. And if you've done many books, you feel quite happy. But, uh, well, here's an example. In Mauritius, um, one man, where the, the visitors of the program are mostly all Indians, one man challenged Prabhupada and said, look, this Arjuna, he, was, he already heard the Bhagavad Gita and he's supposed to be aloof, but when his son got killed, he became so angry. What was his son's name? Son's name? Abhimanyu. Abhimanyu, okay, very good. He became so upset, you know, he, he lost his uh, equanimity. Prabhupada said, well, that's natural that if your son is killed, to feel some distress. But, the, the, but that Arjuna, his underlying situation was the same, was that he didn't give up his service. He went on with his service to Krishna. So it's natural, just like it's, if it's very cold, you, you feel it, right? If you're very hungry, you feel it. But, uh, and and you, feel, you do feel distress unless you're extremely advanced, but um, that one may feel cold or, or hungry or distressed, but one's equanimity is that one goes on with one's service to Krishna. And one may, for one's service to Krishna, one will uh, dress and eat, dress in warm clothes and eat, so he can go on with his service to Krishna. He doesn't think, well, let me just let me, get, let me get a nice warm place and I'll go to sleep. And all day. He may sleep if it's required to become fresh to serve Krishna. So his whole thought is how to serve Krishna best, that's all. And he can accept distress for doing that. Devotees, I mean, this movement spread all over the world because devotees accept many, accepted many difficulties and distressing situations for doing so. Right? Devotees deliberately chose to accept many difficulties because they wanted that Krishna's mission should be served. So it wasn't that they didn't feel the, the distress of, oh, whatever it may be, going from a rich country to a poor country and going with people whose culture they don't understand and language they don't understand and trying to establish Krishna consciousness there. Difficulties would be there unfavorable governments, unfavorable people, risk, so many things, sickness. But devotees accepted those difficulties because they wanted to serve Krishna.
Would a devout Christian or Muslim find his way to God? Well, actually, they, ultimately one has to understand who God is and how he can be pleased. So, again, devout, that devoutness, if it's not on the basis of proper understanding, then you may be very devout, but that in itself is not enough to please Krishna. One has to know what he wants. So one actually has to, Yo mameva samurho janati purushottamam sa sarva bhajati mam sarva bhave na bharata. One who knows me, Krishna says, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, without doubting, worships me in all respects. But one cannot do so unless one knows Krishna. We found that the, the average devout Muslim and Christian devoutly believes that God has given the animals for them to slaughter and kill. Slaughter kills the same one. And eat. So they're doing something which is not very pleasing to Krishna. So, they have to come to a more developed standard. They won't even want, just like you, they, if you tell them about Krishna, they'll, they'll, they'll react against. Say, what was this? This is wrong. This is the devil. This is the, they're supposed to be, uh, they consider themselves lovers of, they're lovers of God, but haters of Krishna. How is that possible? It means they don't actually know God. They, they have a conception of God as being a, their order supplier for their sense gratification. It means they don't actually know Him. So their devoutness is a kind of a pious sense gratification, actually. They think that God is supposed to serve me. So... It, it isn't pure theism. And that you're not going to get Krishna because Krishna is not the... Maybe as Paramatma, he is the, the order supplier. He does do that function. But, uh, what is that? Eko bahunam yo viditati kaman. He does do that. But one's, lo one's love does not develop for Krishna the Supreme Personality of Godhead, unless one understands Him to be the Supreme Enjoyer and oneself to be, uh, one has to be the uh, unconditional servant. So can they attain God? We can say they do so, but in only in a very primary way. The, the pure love for Krishna cannot arise unless one understands that, that God is Krishna, who He is. So again, it's either sentimentalism or fanaticism. And that will not bring us to pure devotional service. You know, that has to be, one has to be trained to come up from the neophyte level. Again, we find in Bhagavatam, the, the uh, neophyte, intermediate, and topmost devotee, they're, they're uh, Sarva, what is that, the uh, topmost level devotee? Sarva Bhute Shuyapashen, Bhagavad Bhava Matmana, Bhutani Bhagavat Yatmani, Esha Bhagavatotama. One who sees all living beings in relationship to Krishna, he sees all living beings as being part and parcel of God. So that's his uh, divine vision. And the Madhya Madhikari, his division is uh, Ishvare Tad Adhin Eshu. Balisheshu, Vishatshucha, Prema Maitri Kripo Peksha Yakaroti Samadhyama. He has the knowledge of there is God, He is the object of our love. There are devotees, they are the object of our friendship. There are the innocent people, they are the object of our compassion. And envious people, we simply ignore them. And the neophyte devotee, his vision is, he sees God, but his in, in, in an improper manner. He sees there's God and there's me and that's it. That uh, Acharya meva hariyesh puja ya shadhyam vite shadhyam vita na tad bhakti shu chanyeshu sabhakta prakritasmita. His vision of God is materially influenced. 
She says, God, I worship him very faithfully, but he doesn't recognize who's actually a devotee or anything.